All right, welcome to A Critical Dragon, where AP normally talks about narrative in film, television, and books. And I am obviously not AP. He has been turned into a very pretty unicorn. However, I am joined by Steven Erickson, author of Rejoice. Hi, Steve. Hi, how are you? I am fantastic. How are you? Good, good. So we're going to be talking about Rejoice today. And yeah. um, we are not going to be talking about narrative in Rejoice. We're going to be talking about oh. actually the ideas in Rejoice. Um, because I think what you've done with this book is fantastic and meaningful and everybody should read it. And on that note, I suppose I should say spoilers. This is going to be an entire yeah. spoiler chat. Um, and this is not going to be a review of the book. This is going to be me and Steve and eventually AP talking about what is so amazing about this book and how it should be read by everybody. Well, uh, let's, yeah, I mean, in many respects, I consider that book uh, one of, uh, certainly not unique, but sir, a, a failure. Um, in the same fashion that you know the Carcanus books are a failure in terms of finding finding the audience at the right time and trying to predict what an audience is going to go for um i've given up uh, i have no idea anymore uh, i just i just throw it out there so i mean there are a lot of things that sort of drove me to write the book and i thought the timing would be good for it uh, but it seems that uh, probably not um, things were pretty volatile when thing, you know, when the book came out politically worldwide, um, or maybe it was just that, you know, the story was more of a, a thought experiment than it was, you know, a traditional novel in that respect. Um, probably about as plotted as a contemporary fiction novel, don't you think? I loved every moment of it. Okay. Um, like I am the audience you were reaching for, I think. And, and I think that people definitely need to be in the right place to read it because it's, as you said, a thought experiment, but beyond that, you're holding up a mirror to all of your readers in this book and saying, this is, this is the end result. This is, this is the problem. Um, and you are the problem. And I think, that is why more people need to read it and more people need to be aware of their own kind of bias when they're encountering a book like this, because a book like this really has a lot to offer humanity in general. Well, and, and yeah, I, I mean, a lot of sort of immediate responses on Amazon sort of reduced everything to, uh, you know, well, this is, this is, left or right or, or, or a condemnation of the right and elevation of the left and it was never a political novel um no i never you, you know you, did you see it as a political novel no. i mean there are characters who who you know describe uh post-scarcity as you know what they the way they interpreted it is basically as um communism yeah. And it's got nothing to do with communism. Yeah. Post-scarcity is, is a much, much broader issue. Um, and, you know, historically, um, the communist experiment has, has repeatedly failed. And it's, it, it's failed because there is a structure, a, a social structure, a hierarchy um, that inevitably and invariably corrupts it. Uh, the basic premise of communism. So to me, you have to throw that stuff aside. It's, it's not relevant to, to the novel. Um, but the notion of post-scarcity is the one that I really wanted to explore. Because I don't think, you know, even when Ian Banks in his culture novels really sort of um, pulled back the curtain on the idea of post-scarcity, that was far in the future. Um, so we never really got to see the transition period and, and the experience of what happens when you've got an entire civilization that for most of its history um, has been founded upon the notion of scarcity. Um, 
not just in economic terms, but in subsistence terms, uh, in territorial terms. Uh, Post-scarcity just goes in every direction. Um, so scarcity in, in that respect is basically the what defines um, how we have uh, basically structured our societies and our cultures. And then for this book, I wanted to throw post-scarcity right in our face um, at this time so that we had to then face with, come down to sort of reordering and restructuring uh, all the paradigms. Um, and so once you, once you start thinking in those terms, you realize that, well, actually this is value systems that we're now talking about. And so what happens when our value system is completely unplugged and we need to find a new one? I, th I think you did a brilliant job at it. And I think <laughs> you did a really good job at discussing exactly what that would look like, not just from like a centric point, right? Not from one viewpoint, not an American centric viewpoint, not Canadian viewpoint. Like you, you did it worldwide. And the way you walk people through your readers through every aspect and how this concept that you introduce in the novel would affect every different nation, even the little ones, um, was just brilliantly done because we got so many different perspectives of what things would look like. Um, and and I, my favorite. The, my favorite section that that you touch on throughout the whole thing is um, Colo and Nila, mm -hmm. because that shows something that I think needs to be highlighted around the world, and that that stuff does happen and still is happening because of scarcity, because mm -hmm. things like this happen in the world. Um, but the people that dismiss the book out of hand, there's an old quote by by Oscar Wilde, I think, in he said that um, books that the world call immoral show the world its own shame. And mm. I think that people that dismiss this book out of the hand are unwilling to look in the mirror and see their own culpability, I guess, in what you're pointing out in the novel. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I was hoping I was going, I, I tried to offer. Um, I guess a way of seeing things in terms of what we have done, what we have experienced, um, and that culpability. Uh, and I was thinking about it just the other day because it suddenly struck me that I know you haven't read the the Malazan series, but there's a character in there called a Cobian who um, talks at length or argues at length about uh, forgiveness in, in a sense, redemption. Um, and the giving of compassion. And it, it suddenly struck me that this book is actually a continuation of Itkovian's argument because with a character like Kolo, I mean, his actions are, you know, almost by any measure unforgivable. And yet once, once the, the alien AI has imposed um, a kind of removal of the option of revenge um he's you know you're left with this character and um can you be sympathetic to this character can you be um can you acknowledge that you know any any one life at any one point in time regardless of what it's done um has the um the possibility of redemption in its future and that's a really difficult question to actually answer because, you know, we, we, we talk in terms of war crimes, we talk in terms of, um, uh, you know, acts of genocide and all the rest. And then, you know, you, you find the person, you arrest them and you, you put them up on the, in, you know, in the court courtroom. And then the question is, well, all right, how do you, how do you as a society, um, come to terms with what this individual has done and to what extent is that individual's own history and background and life experience um, playing a formative role in the actions that they undertook and so you know because if you think in terms of, of genocide it, it's historically 
repeated. And so, you know, people experience uh, and then they pass on that experience and in a fairly negative fashion. Um, and so when you, you know, you put somebody up like that um, in a court of law, um, what's, what's, what's being tried is actually not the individual. It is the entire, the entire culture and its history and all the rest. And so that's what really complicates things. And so Colo for me was, was, yeah, one of those characters that, you know, I had to really think carefully of how I was going to handle this because, you know, his, his actions were uh, deplorable. They, they absolutely are deplorable. And the compassion that Neela, Adam really mm -hmm. shows um, Colo, not really Neela, but the compassion that, that he needs healed too doesn't forgive him no what he's done no um but it absolutely explores this idea of and and towards the end of the novel you absolutely explore this idea of inherited trauma mm -hmm. um that the, the children inherit trauma that they are raised in and that forms who they are and that is really an important point because you explore domestic violence too and um that's not forgivable either like his acts were deplorable in a different way but deplorable mm -hmm. less and at the end we're left with a broken shaking man that knows he did wrong but you know there's no outlet for him anymore he can't no, no. use his fists and that forces and colo too to an extent right they're they're forced to confront what they have done and live with it and then they have that choice of either changing adapting reflecting and and getting better or you know taking the other thing that you explore um, in the novel, um, taking the easy way out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and of course, they're all stand-ins for human civilization, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, and they're, they're sort of the, um, the little waving flags of, of what we have done as a civilization and as a species to the planet and to other life forms and, and everything else. So. Uh, yeah, I guess there's an element of discomfort uh, um, that I'm sort of inviting there in the reader, um, because you can you can you know be very specific and say, well, you know, Cola was uh, a child warrior and then uh, a recruiter uh, of child soldiers, um, and so be very specific on um, that person's crimes. But he's coming out of the Congo and the Congo historically um, has been destroyed on a global scale in the same fashion, the way, you know, Haiti, for example, has been treated ever since the, you know, the, the slave uprising. Yeah. Um, you know, it, Haiti is, is part of one side of an island that has the Dominican Republic on the other side. Yeah. The Dominican Republic's doing fine. Haiti? Yeah. No. Yeah, well, you know, it, it Dominican, continues to get punished. Yeah, yeah, the Dominican Republic is is fine and flourishing, and yeah. and nature and trees and forests and Dominican pro, 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 uh, the, Haiti is completely deforested, yeah. right, and devastated because of yeah. exactly what you point out. There's there is room um, for yeah. all of us to help Haiti, yeah. and yet. Yeah, and and Colo is Colo is in result of these these global decisions, um, whether it was Belgium or um, now corporations moving in, basically looking for um, extremely rare minerals and all the rest. Um, he is the result of that, and so he is everyone's responsibility. And I guess that's the hard part to sort of. Sometimes I think if I'd made the book twice as long um, and put a lot more action in, it might have been more successful. I don't know. Um, but I wanted it to be fairly sort of to the point, I guess. And it is, and it is. And um, 
I think that it's very successful as it is. And I know that I'm only one reader and, and <laughs> probably I have bought this book like three or four times because I keep giving it to people um, because they think it's important that we need to look at these things. And I think what you've done with it is really, really important. In, uh, in fact, one of the very first notes that I made was on your, um, you have lines right in the beginning of every single yeah, section. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool the very, yeah, the very first thing you say is there is not and never has been an extraterrestrial presence on earth. It is important for you to keep believing that and this is why. And so that is really, really important. It's a warning. It's like, get your shit together, people. <laughs> this, is, this is why we haven't had an alien intervention. There has never been an extraterrestrial presence on Earth. Um, but here's what could happen if. And then I think the way that you treated it was really gentle compared to the way that it could be. You know, mm -hmm. like you treated this gently in the face of a first contact in a very, very different way, which we should discuss um, because first contact isn't really ever treated this way. And I think you even mentioned that in the book, um, but it's, it's yeah, it fun. Tends, it, tends, it tends not to be treated this way, but that quote um, is not quite saying what you think it's saying. Oh, um, tell me, tell me, what did I get wrong? Well, basically what I'm saying is the reason why it's important for you to th think that there has been no contact and, and no presence um, is the very idea that if there, if, if there has been, um, then the message that is being delivered to us by, by the presence of, of uh, alien species um, visiting this planet is that we are engaged in something that these other far more advanced species are not are not prepared to um, interfere with at this moment. Um, and the warning is if they were prepared to interfere with it at this moment, this is what would happen. Well, does that also mean that if if they are willing to interfere at that moment, then we have reached the critical Oh, I think so. Right. I think so, so. And, and the, yeah, the weird thing is I did so much research. So I went down all the rabbit holes I could. Um, and so I, I spent a lot of time thinking about uh, the arguments for and against um, UFOs, for example. Um, and it's quite interesting. Um, I don't know if we should get into this discussion. I know you had a whole bunch of questions and you took a whole bunch of notes. Maybe we could save it for a bit, but it's pretty fundamental to the thinking behind the novel. Um, and I can get into it now at length, or we can we can talk about a few more scenes. Your choice. Let's do what you want to do. As long as we're talking about this book, I'm happy. I do want to touch on the animals because I think that's really important too, um, because you know animals. Um, but, um, no, no, let, let's talk about these things because those, I mean, the specific elements uh, of the novel, um, is sort of why we're sitting here talking, um, the background and my thinking that led up to setting up the scenario of the novel is something that I can, I could probably finish off with because it, we, we kind of, we, we leave the fictional realm and we move into the, the realm of, of the research that the author uh, undertakes. And then the, in my case, the conclusions I drew. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, this is the longest I've ever been with, with AP where he hasn't said anything. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. I, you know, unicorns, they take away their little voices. Exactly. Um, <laughs> if so, we see that unicorn starting to deflate, then we'll know it's definitely AP. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about some of the really th fun things. Um, when I'm saying fun things, this is a very serious book, and I, I can't express oh, that enough. Is it? And I mean, 
I was hoping that there was a lot of humor in it. Um, there is, and that's what I was just getting ready to touch on. Um, you infuse these really heavy, heavy topics, um, forcing us to look at ourselves and go, holy crap, right? And not even just ourselves, but our system and the communities we live in. Um, and then you infuse things with humor. And I, there were there were quite a few moments where I was reading it that I, I was laughing out loud. Um, and I found that refreshing because people often take um, serious topics more serious when there is humor underlying mm. it. And the things we are talking about, the things that you're talking about in the novel, you're talking about like climate change and systematic things that are holding people down and the systems we're living in and you're doing it in a humorous way. And so that to get that message out and to get people to realize, hey, this is a mirror and I'm not afraid to look in it, it needs to be a little bit humorous. And I found that that really, really helped with some of the the harder scenes that you have in the book because you mm -hmm. you have some hard ones that are that are hard to read but are important to read so that mm -hmm. you can understand them um i really did uh i i really did like the humor in it uh, one of the first things that that you put in there that I, that i just i giggled at was you said it was a very small thing about the size of an suv and i'm like <laughs> <laughs> definitely not small good play um and i i really did like the humor um the un um the un ambassador she was yeah very good i had great fun writing the presidential meetings <laughs> because <laughs> they were they were just they were so much fun um I think there's there's certainly a, there's a point there where somebody somebody says we're going to have more empty rooms than anywhere else in terms of building that factories. Yeah. 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 That was like one of the the last ones. That was a, the American system yeah. um, where they were talking about yeah um, building the systems that they you yeah. know have been ignoring. They could have done it. Um, I do have some interesting questions here. Um, in regards, and I said we weren't going to talk about narrative, and and I really, you know, I'd rather focus on the fundamentals of the book and the method in the book, but I really like the way you use illusions here. Um, you make the reader work for them, and it's it's not like a typical illusion that authors plop into a book where you know it's common knowledge and people get to be like, oh yeah, that's 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 a good thing. Um, and that I understand that now. It's like you put illusions in that you have to work for. Um, and one of the very first ones I came across, well, not the first one, but one of the ones I found really interesting was your reference to split ends. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to know, um, was that intentional? Like what? Because their their number one hit, the thing that they're known for, obviously, is that one song. Um, History repeats itself, and so I found that interesting and funny. Who you put that shirt on? Mm -hmm. um, and so, was that intentional? Oh, of course, yeah. Okay, yeah. Because that that uh, illusion tickled me to no end. Right. Well, I mean, there, there's a serious side to it as well. Obviously, the history repeating itself. Um, yeah. Uh, personified in that character. Yeah. Yeah, and that that was, it was. And then and then the Exxon hack, for example. Again, I'm trying to sort of trigger. This is a global, this is a global problem. It's 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 specific to an area, but it's triggered by all these things outside, all these 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 forces, that work. Yeah, and I, I found that really interesting and I really, I really like that. Um, I'm trying to find some of my notes. So you included a lot of references to other authors, mm -hmm. um, specifically Lovelock. Mm -hmm. um, and the Gaia hypothesis mm -hmm. and 
what was your intention, I suppose, behind all of those? Well, one of the things that, that's often thrown me, um, and we, we're starting to see a little bit more of it now, uh, depending on the story or the being told, um, is that quite often uh, a fictional version of uh, us, um, our society, our, you know, the cities, um, our setting, as it were, um, within the genre, say, of science fiction, does not acknowledge the presence of science fiction within our culture. So in other words, um, you can have something like, oh, I don't even Independence Day, I don't think there's a single reference to Star Trek in the film Independence Day. No, I don't think so. Weird, isn't it? If you think about it. Yeah. Um, and so those aspects, they are actually part of our culture. And um, I always found it peculiar that they were always absent. And you knew they were absent for legal reasons in terms of the, the, the publisher. Um, but that didn't seem to be a good enough reason for sort of keeping these things out. So um, originally I wanted to contact at least a half dozen science fiction authors and have them write um, op-eds or um, some kind of commentary. Um, and then I realized that that was going to take way too long. And then, you know, what happens if one of the authors says, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm 4% of, of the novel. So I want, you know, and then, and then suddenly we're getting into the agents going crazy on the contracts and all the rest. So uh, I basically reduced it to a good close friend in Robert Sawyer. And I contacted him and I talked to him about it. And, um, and he was right on board. Um, he, he read, you know, what, I, what I'd written to that point and said, yeah, he was absolutely fine. Um, and then when I had him do his speech, um, I mean, I've known Rob for a long time. So I, I tried to sort of capture his cadence and, and the way he would deliver things. Um, mm -hmm. and then I wrote, I sent it to him and then I wrote, uh, I basically said, you know, change it wherever you needed to change it. Um, so that it really, it's it sort of, it's you. And so that what's being said is, is what you would say. And it took about three, four days. And then he wrote back and said, um, it's all fine. So, um, so that's actually not Rob Sawyer. It's actually me, but me channeling Rob Sawyer. Rob Sawyer. So, I was, I was going to ask because you did capture him really well, um, in, in that, and, and the way I guess I could hear him kind of oh, yeah. <laughs> talking about it and the way, um, Pinborough was just like, he knew he was the smartest man in the room. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And he would have been. Yeah, absolutely. And not, you know, not having any kind of like, like, I'm not going to say this because I'm in front of the prime minister. No, no, no. I'm yeah. just going to say it. Like, you need to hear this. You need to be kind of, you know this thrown in your face this is what you need to say this is what your people want to hear so yeah. and i i thought that was because uh, i could hear him saying it and it was really oh, yeah. yeah you know it was really really nice um yeah i mean it would be, it would be really cool to, to get you know a couple of more uh, science fiction authors uh weighing in there um but i i think i probably got scared and decided not to do it so well i think i think um having Samantha August mm. be the one that is speaking and speaking of the science fiction community like I you did a really good job bringing it all around and because of my training because of mm -hmm. my field which is obviously science fiction um it, there were a lot of bits where I was just like, you know, a little smiley face in my notes and things like that because these are people that I read that I know that that I have interacted with, that I've had conversations with, and it's nice to see kind of that in there. And you did a really good job bringing in the science fiction community. Oh, cool. Um, not just with Samantha August, right, but specifically Canadian science fiction too, because that's, you know, that's often kind of like often left field when people, mm. in, especially in America, are studying um, science fiction. It's not really Canadian science fiction that we're studying, though it's important and really good stuff coming out of Canadian science fiction, but you did a good job including the community. 
mm. um, how um, science fiction is this community and and you, you did include um, Star Trek, Close mm -hmm. Encounters, um, The Bird of Prey was a really nice touch. Um, I caught a reference to Firefly um, in here. Uh, so, it might have been. I, been. I think um, that I did. Yeah, um, there's Independence Day for sure. Independence Day and you uh, Close Encounters, Independence Day, Star Trek. Yeah, it was all there and all yeah. important. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and volumes that it speaks. Um, when you include them because there's so much history in science fiction and so many um, people to call from and things that are important in science fiction because science fiction, let's face it, it's a big old knock on the head and say, um, hey, mm. wake mm. up. Um, yeah. Pretty much all science fiction is like imagining what things could happen in the future and if we don't, and I really appreciated the idea that um, <laughs> you made a point of saying nobody's asking the science fiction authors. Um, perhaps yeah. we should be talking to the science fiction author. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, perhaps. Yeah, it, it's one of those. It's one of those aspects, but it goes all all the way back to the value system, uh, basic uh, overhaul that, that I'll, I'll talk about towards the end of, of this. But I mean, Samantha August to me was a merging of Atwood and Ursula Le Guin. And that's kind of how I wanted to envision her. You captured that. I hope so. I hope so. Um, and I want to, you know, maybe a bit of Cameron Hurley now, actually, now that I think about it, because Cameron's, you know, she's she's uh, a force to be reckoned with. And I've always appreciated that. So, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, you did. You captured that really well because she does. She's, in fact, um, I, I dearly love Samantha August, um, that, that might be the feminist in me, but I dearly, dearly loved her. Um, and the, where is it? The first, uh, text she sent oh, yeah. off yeah. to Hamish, um, I've got <laughs> in space, no one cares if you smoke. <laughs> and I, you know, it's just one of those laugh out loud moments because I can imagine myself saying that, you know, if I was in that situation, sending that text to my husband, you know, it's like in space, no one cares if you smoke. Yeah. Um, it, laugh out loud. I really appreciated Samantha August. And one of the very first things I saw that you portrayed with her is calm, cool logic when she first wakes up. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in, let's face it, um, Science Fiction is a boys club, was oh, yeah. is slowly changing um, it over is changing time. Now, yes. It is, it is. And there are a lot more, um, not only women voices, but BIPOC voices. And that is a really positive and happy move. Um, but the way that people normally perceive um, you know, when they think about science fiction as something other than, oh, flights of fancy, you know, and not that it's doing something amazing um, in literature, uh, they think, oh, women characters are always uh, an afterthought, right? They're a subplot. They're, they're like, oh, look, she's there, she's that. But you have a science fiction author being abducted and waking up going, um, May in the hospital and she's very calm, cool, collected mm. and logical about it. And like, all right, let's see where this goes. Let's play this out. Let's see. And then she tells this alien presence, mm, I'm not sure I want to trust you yet. I don't know that that what you're telling me is something that I should buy into. And she's like her and the UN and um, kind of liked um the vice president of the united states mm -hmm. but not as much as i liked um Pinbro, for example she was she was really really good but your female characters are excellent and they come across as really you know forces to be reckoned with all of the strong women characters that you put in this um yeah right and think 
think of your standard, I mean, with the exception of uh, Carl Sagan's um, Contact, which in the film had Jodie Foster, uh, you know, she, who carries, uh, as, carries the gravitas of, of her acting experience. So, so you, you can buy that as a character. But generally, especially in fiction, when you're talking about first contact novels, who are you talking about? You're talking about, you know, astronauts who were fighter pilots and you're talking about scientists. Um, and think of how scientists were treated in Independence Day, um, mm. which is Brent Spiner's um, mad scientist uh, shtick. Yeah. And, but women, I mean, really? It, they're just not there. They're just not there. It, it's the guys taking charge. Um, even think in terms of Close Encounters, um, even within that one, which was such a, a kind of a generous approach, uh, embracing approach to, to First Contact, um, it was uh, Richard Dreyfus, not the woman he was traveling with who stepped onto the ship. Um, it was all the men, men in black, basically, you know, waiting to line on to, you know, to, to walk onto the ship with their their, their, their sunglasses and suit and briefcases. It's yeah. like, where were the women? They just weren't there. They just weren't there. Um, and that can be, I mean, it's just frustrating. It's as if, you know, it's like in fantasy novels, why, if you're gonna create an entire world, why would you eliminate 51% of it in terms of the main players of a story? You know, it just doesn't make any sense. You know, why would you carry that patriarchy across. And so I definitely wanted um, that this was, this was, this is actually more of a novel about uh, women, actually, um, in terms of the main characters, mm -hmm. uh, even, you know, characters like Annie, um, or Neela, for that matter. Yep. Um, in fact, even um, and Vivian. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah. Ruth. Well, it wasn't Ruth, it was Ruth. Yeah, and Ruth, yeah. Because I think a, an instinct in, in me just said that if this were to happen, if if we were to be hit with that existential crisis, women would handle it better than men would. I think that's my conclusion. I, yeah, I think I think you're you're not wrong. Um, though that is, I guess, a little unfair of us to say, right? Like. Um, certain people wouldn't handle it well mm. um faced with that i guess um would be more more you know people that make a living off of thriving off of the suffering of others and of you know pushing the the whole you know media lie kind mm. of thing um and people that are trying to get theirs while other people are suffering around them. Right, which is all, it's part and parcel of the patriarchy, isn't it? Yeah. Patriarchal system, because, you know, testosterone is, is the main fuel for that. So competition, um, getting one over the other, um, all of these things, um, that whole sort of ethos of survival of the fittest uh, that's been translated into modern society is, is it's very much a male thing, at least in my experience. It's, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's kind of legitimizing what, you know, sociobiologists would, you know, describe as um, these basic elements of human nature uh, that are, that are gender specific. Yeah. Whether that's and true or not, I don't know, but. You know. We went into the, the issue of internalizing the oppressor too um, at that point and reinforcing the narrative that you're fighting against. Mm -hmm. um, and Samantha kind of sort of falls into that at one point mm -hmm. and then and then says, I must really be frazzled um, to be thinking this way. I can't remember mm -hmm. if she says it or Hamish says it, um, but it's, it's like she falls into this reinforcing narrative um, of the, you know, internalized oppressor and, and then she snaps out of it and you know, you even you even um, <laughs> did a really fun thing with Athena, um, mm. uh, and it's it's just 
Adam, Adam keeps trying to push Eve on people and it's no, it's Athena. And then Athena, like, you know, immediately snapping back at Adam going, um, no. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, yeah, Samantha needed her, her sort of dark night of the soul kind of thing. Right. And so that was that moment where, yeah. 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 It's got difficult. Yeah. It was really, really, really fun. Hello. Hello. Welcome to a critical dragon. Oh, it's, it's great to be here. <laughs> We're going to not discuss narrative and film, television, and books. Well, what are we discussing then? The amazing novel that Steve wrote. Oh, that narrative that he wrote. That's a book. You know. Yeah. Don't yeah. make me turn you back into a unicorn. <laughs> Uh, so uh, how how far along are you in, in having this discussion? What can I join in with? Or do you want me to just sit here and keep quiet for another while? We Oops. are kind of jumping around, which is going to confuse any readers that have not yet read this. And I'm okay with confusing them. Mm. If they want to know what it's all about, they can buy the book. Mm. Okay. Hey. Any comments you want to make right now, AP? Um, well, first of all, do I have any comments? Of course I got to have comments. I just, you know, just arrived. I need time to put my mind in order. Um, I really liked how this uh, is a, a thought experiment where you essentially find one fracture point and you mm -hmm. go, right, if I change this one value, if this is the thing that I play with what are the potential repercussions of it and then play it out and you play it out in a psychologically real reaction system because when i first read this as i was reading through i kept formulating arguments against what you were doing mm -hmm. and then i would get to the next section and that next section would be dealing explicitly with or referencing and exploring the thing that I had just thought of. And I'm like, oh, right, okay, fine. He thought of that thing. <laughs> but what about this? And each time like you systematically go through all of these, these different aspects of what, what it would mean if we were post scarcity. So if that is the one thing that changes, um, then we look at, well, what effect does that have? And you, you looked at it in terms of political systems, capitalism, you looked at it in terms of um, the individual reaction. And each time it was, it was looking at an underlying psychology of aggression that underlies everything because biologically, evolutionary, everything has always been about in order for me to get mine, I have to deprive someone else. It is a zero sum game. And that aggression to make sure that we get that is at the core of who we are as humans. And we have then built that into systems. And because we're inside the system, we can't see what would happen if you change that element. But by imposing um, the, the interdiction fields at the very beginning and preventing violence, you go, well, violence and aggression are the corner of law. They're the corner of government. They're the cornerstone mm -hmm. of social interactions. All of it underlies everything that we have created and it underlies our value system. And by uh, placing an interdiction on aggression and then taking care of the most very basic needs, water, food and shelter. Nothing fancy. We're not talking about everyone getting a laptop or everyone having really cool internet access. It's if you have guaranteed food, if you have guaranteed shelter, if you have guaranteed clean water, what, what more does humanity need? And you keep building on that and exploring it deeper and each time extrapolating further al along that line of reasoning. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Um... <clears throat> It's weird because the ET was simply a stand-in basically, because if you proceed on the assumption 
which seems to be driving um, humanity's sense of itself, at least in, in post-Renaissance, post-Enlightenment uh, eras, um, where, as you were talking about, certain elements of common behavior are recognized or even rationalized as um, human nature. But that implies that we are subject to these aspects of human nature. Um, in other words, they're built in. And so then you think, well, okay, well, let's look at the animal kingdom. And yeah, we see predation. Um, and sometimes we see species that you know, will kill more than they need. Uh, foxes will do that in a hen house, for example. Um, so we're seeing sort of examples of um, uh, violence for its own sake. And so on that basis, we think, okay, well, all right, this is, this, this is biological. Um, but then again, a fox really has not the level of sentience to actually um, alter its behavior, whereas we do. And so then we're looking at almost dismantling the notion of these aspects of human nature as being written in stone, as being laws. And um, we're now looking at a system whereby collectively we can choose not to do things. But then we, we then turn around and we say, but we do them anyways because that's human nature. And so it's this, it's this kind of a, this loop of logic that, that proceeds and one justifies the other and then it just flips around. And so the idea, I guess, for the novel was definitely, let's break this. Let's break this notion and, and say, well, you know, instead of ET, this could have been the hand of God. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter what, what that, that uh, or originating um, aspect is to this story. Um, it's actually what happens when that, when those those um, belief systems are um, not dismantled but shut down because the dismantling is something we have to do ourselves. Um, you can't do it externally, but you can shut down its avenues, its its its, um, its means of expression, and then just sit back and see what happens. I, I was I, I like I was thinking about dismantling versus shutting down um, and that is an excellent excellent point because we can dismantle but it's not going to change the problem um, unless we get to the root of it and you know if you want real change you have to get to the root of the problem yeah and I mean yeah historically you know we've dismantled the institution generally of slavery it's not solved the problem, has it? No, because it's still everywhere. Um, um, but not not even as an institution, but no. the knock-on effect of what slavery has produced um, yeah. is 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 present within our within our culture and quite so. Even though you dismantle something, you're not you're not creating the other side of things. Yeah, that we have to do ourselves. We have to do that work, as it were. Yeah, and you quite clearly say that um, throughout the novel that it's it's we have to do the work. We have the means. We have to do the work. Um, and I, I found that very very interesting. AP, well, do you something else? Well, one of the things I was going to bring up is uh, in terms of relating this or uh, comparing this to other first contact novels, and obviously, what one of the first contact stories that. Um, I think this has a lot of similarity to, in some respects, is the day the earth. Oh, the day the earth. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say childhood's end, but yeah. Um, but one of the reasons I, I sort of wanted to bring this up is any time we see iterations of that story, of aliens choosing to contact us, we see it in Star Trek. Uh, we see it in all versions of the day the earth stood still. We we see it in all of these things that it's when humanity reaches a certain level of technological ability 
that's when aliens go, oh, okay, you you can come and join us, or we're we're yeah. now going to have a look. What I I find absolutely fascinating about this is the aliens looked at it and it's humans are almost irrelevant to the consideration of what is going on because they don't live in a human centric universe we do and so they look at it as the earth as a biome the earth that uh, has a certain finite number of resources a finite uh, biodiversity and a certain lifespan and their decision is based on can we save the planet? It's not the the decision about whether or not to save humanity is not made at the beginning. And it's up in the air for quite some time mm -hmm. as to where these uh, the alien entities, the, the AI that uh, is representing them is going to come down on this issue because it's not about saving humanity. It's about planet and the planet contains us which is why we're being considered but that i thought was was slightly different yeah and, and going back to that that notion you brought up of other contact novels where the deciding aspect of our progress is technological i mean as soon as you said that i thought yeah, that to me is one of my huge problems with all of this stuff. It's, it's suggesting that once we get the technology, mm -hmm. then we've joined the, the big boys club. Whereas we would never be allowed to join the big boys club if we had that technology right now, because we're simply too rapacious. We're too, we're too, we're too aggressive. We're too violent. Um, so no, it, it, it's, it's not technology that actually would, you know, pull us into uh, a galactic community of any kind um, that would be necessary in some, in some sense, uh, simply to get out there, get out into space and outside our solar system. But what needs to happen is I, I dare, I, I almost hate saying it, it has to be a spiritual uh, progression. Um, and I don't mean that necessarily in, in a religious sense. I mean, in a sense of fully understanding the, the finite limits of our space and our place and recognizing that we're in a position of stewardship as opposed to simply um, predation uh, on this planet. And that's the thing that needs to sort of kick into place. I would think before any of these, um, uh, aliens that are apparently visiting us on almost a regular basis uh, will do anything in terms of full contact. Um, I just don't think psychologically uh, as a species we're there yet. And if anything is holding, holding them back, it's that. Well, okay, let's, I, I, I know that there's a blanket ban on talking about narrative apparently now on my channel. Um, <laughs> it's just this one specific video. But, to, to talk about a specific narrative element that I, I think was was necessary for us to engage with believing the progression in the novel. So you start with the interdiction fields that the AI puts on the ground to uh, stop violence. And we work through those psychological ramifications. And we see all of those reactions from, from media moguls, from politicians, from soldiers on the ground, from um, the the gun runner, uh, people in their own homes, uh, domestic abuse victims, uh, the the young punk wannabe bank robber, we see how it affects them. But what we then see is the constant arguing against it, the constant need to defeat this AI that's come down, and um, one of the the major moments that unifies the earth is the revelation of an external threat species. And we see this on a micro scale. We see it on a macro scale that mm -hmm. until we see an external threat, we will subdivide our groups, our tribes, our uh, affiliations into an us and them over and over again from the, the largest macro scale on, on, in terms of global alliances all the way down to
to a local community. And it's only when there's an external threat do we apparently have the capacity to see the points of connection between us because they're thrown into sharp relief by contrast with the threat that's attacking both of us. And that, and that is one aspect of uh, first contact uh, science fiction that has been present all along. It's recognized very early on that that external threat is what unifies us. I mean, it, it's at its most simplistic, it's independ Independence Day, right? Um, and I did realize that if I'm in, if I'm writing a first contact novel, um, I think it was almost uh, required that I have to introduce that thing because I mean, I'm sitting there writing this thing thinking, well, what is the solution? How do you work this out? Um, where do you go from here? And I don't have the answers to it. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm writing this and, and thinking, I've set up this thought experiment and I'm following it through. I got no solutions. <laughs> Sorry. You know, it, it is just too big. Um, nor would I presume to have solutions. So I'm just having everybody's, you know, all the characters are simply struggling through. They're wading through as best they can. Um, but then, you know, there is sufficient anomalous shit out there that I could draw from to build up the scenario of what was happening on the moon. And so I just, I just took it and ran with it. And um, uh, I, I thought it was important also to, um, at least from the Western point of view, make the least understood civilization on earth uh, be the one actually save people on the moon. And the most compassionate. <laughs> in a way, but that's just, that's just in that humanity. moment. Yeah, yeah, in that moment, humanity is capable um, and prepared, I think, for that level of compassion. Um, so that was one of the reasons why, it, it may be that, you know, that's one of the reasons why the book has not been, um, no, this might sound too cynical, but it didn't, it didn't place the West front and center. Um, no, and they don't like to be told that they're not number one, right? Like, that's like, we don't like that. Um, but the truth of the matter is, and you cover it so well in the novel that we haven't been, and this is going to make people angry, but mm. we are falling behind in a lot of the areas you point out in your book and, and are just because our centric view of something um, is our centric view of something does not mean that there are not other point of views out there that we need to consider. Um, and, and you handle that really well. And, and again, it's the mirror. And, and if it was not received well, then maybe people aren't comfortable looking in the mirror. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, one of the one of the things that I find fascinating about the portrayal uh, across the world of all of the different characters is that because you try to show the points of connection, the points of humanity, that even characters that you can imagine would have been much more easy to uh, caricature into villainous that you always tried to take that step back to go, no, remember the whole point of this is we are all human. And to try and show that human element to everything. And that that's difficult when we've grown up in a society where we are used to demonizing others, when we are used to uh, taking opposition and turning them into an other, a villain, a monster, and refusing to see the points of connection. And one of the, the moments that really brought this home, and I remember talking to you about it at the time, was the, the pampered sort of spoiled son of the, the media mogul. And he's talking to his brother uh, on a phone conversation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they have that ribbing of each other because they're brothers. And he calls his brother a sociopath because his brother's this business finance mogul. And you know, he's the uh, the waster of the family because he goes, what do I need to do? Like, I'm, I have all of this money from my dad. And I wanted to loathe them so much. But you end their phone conversation with them saying, love you. Hmm. And I remember that was 
difficult for me to read because I wanted them to be villains. I wanted them not to be human. I wanted them not to have any redeeming qualities because I wanted to dislike them. And by giving them that line, you humanized them. Mm. And you you made me think of them as a family, to put them in comparison to the relationship that I have with my family. And that seeing that then played out on the global scale with all of the different characters uh, portraying it in terms of nation state, uh, in terms of individuals. And yeah, you took inspiration from actual people but you change them just enough that, that no this is this is not meant to be a representation exactly of our world that no. this is slightly different and it is one where we because of the thought experiment we need to start seeing these points of connection so i think you soften the harsh light that one position usually casts another in and that, that can be very jarring and very difficult to process when that harsh light is how you have always seen that thing portrayed. To, it challenges that assumption. Yeah, and, and yeah, it's, it's certainly one of the areas where, you know, a lot of the reviews were, were coming out, you know, um, reducing it to political allegiance of some form or another. It seems because I was being too nice to you know the president of Russia or too nice to the Chinese uh, premier or whatever. Yeah, I kind of missed the point, I think. Um, but that happens. But did they not also notice that you were being too nice to um, potentially the president of the United States and too nice to the media mogul and too nice to the, yeah. the arms dealer? It, it's yeah, not. Yeah. yeah, I know. In fact, just because, you know, we knew, I knew this was, we were going to have this conversation. So for the first time I picked up the book this week and I reread it and I could see, and I had even rereading it. I had great fun on the presidential meetings. They were actually, they were written. Uh, there's strong comedic elements running all the way through it, an element of absurdity, um, but not one pointing a finger at the president because the president actually is fairly sharp uh, in this in this novel. Um, it's a lot of his his aides and his uh, the people he's appointed who are complete freaking idiots. <laughs> and well, he recognizes it, right? So but I, you have that line when they're when they're building the uh, institute, the educational institution to upgrade everyone's ability and it's we'll have the most empty rooms and you go, that's <laughs> this is about education. <laughs> they're not meant to be empty. Yeah. Um, yeah. And but the fact that the president just oh, right, fine. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it's you know I can see because of how uh, national politics, particularly in the UK and the US, went after you'd written it, that that would have had uh, a very different lens applied to a lot of this. But mm -hmm. you'd written the book before the elections. Mm -hmm. um so you know sometimes it, it's very hard for our, uh, to cast our memories back to before any of these elections to go was that a foregone conclusion no because at the time the bookie's favorite was x or mm. this this wasn't likely to happen so then what would this book have looked like if the other candidate had won uh, would you still have had the same reaction? But it, of course, we don't live in that world. We live in a world where certain people won elections and that colors then, uh, that real world colors how we perceive the fictive world that you wrote before any of this happened. Yeah, I know, I know. Your timing I mean, sucks. Uh, doesn't it? It really does. Yeah. I think it's uh, always sucked, actually. I mean, it took me eight years to get the publisher of Gardens of the Moon, so it's always sucked. I don't think it does. <laughs> Shall we talk about butterflies briefly? Butterflies? Mm -hmm. Because you include a scene that I oh, yeah. did okay. about butterflies. Um, it's the arms dealer sitting in mm -hmm. his hotel room or his apartment, I suppose. He said it was a condo. And yeah. there's a plant of lilac, lilac, 
No, yes. lavender, I think. Is lavender, it? lavender, underneath the air con to catch the drips. And there are four mm -hmm. butterflies um, floating around the bush. And I found that really, really interesting because butterflies, depending on how you're taking that, we've got change, growth, metamorphosis, right? Like we're the whole world in this moment of metamorphosis and change and growth. And then you have the butterfly effect, which is what mm -hmm. I was looking at going on in the minds of all of the people that were going on, like one little bit of change um, introduced into it and then it's affecting everything worldwide. So I found that really really poignant to put the butterflies in, in that particular scene and with that particular character. Especially that character because in his previous iteration, he pro probably would not have cared whether there was a puddle underneath the air con and drowned butterflies in that puddle. He wouldn't have looked twice. He would have thought, looked at it, thought, okay, mess, got to sweep that up, whatever. Mm -hmm. But the fact that he had actually then put a uh, a potted plant underneath that uh, dripping water, um, which creates a little, a little biosphere um, of, you know, a, a healthy plant and the insects that are drawn to it. And so it, it, it sort of encapsulates um, how fractal um, gestures can be. So the individual gesture, you know, on, on your balcony um, actually has a significance to to the large mac macro elements of things. Um, I, I have to admit, I have a certain fascination for that fractal expression of the universe. Um, it kind of blows my mind that that it exists at all. Uh, it, it's it's a this notion of repeating pattern uh, uh, scaling up and scaling down that has me very suspicious. So, well, on a meta, on a metaphysical level, yes. Butterflies were nicely done. Mm. <laughs> I just in in their impact um, to what's going on in the whole novel. At least I felt that way. Um, the change, the metamorphosis, the growth. Yeah. And all that that implies. Um, I did like uh, like AP did. I had a lot of points that you were bringing up that I was like, I'm fighting you on them, and I made notes on them. And I was fighting them, and I'm like, no, you're wrong, Steve. Um, and then like two paragraphs later, I'm like, damn it, he's right. Mm -hmm. So it, there was a lot of that going on for me. Um, the things that you brought in that I really really appreciated was that you brought in the tunnels for the animals. Um, to mm. back to their natural habitat, sort of like the, the trophic cascade, right? Like, you know, this destruction of natural wildlife and things and not letting things do their, you know, animals do their own thing and nature, because nature is going to do its own thing, no matter yeah. what. Nature is going to do its own thing. Um, we can disappear and nature is going to be just fine. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, it would thrive without us here. Um, but I liked that the birds could fly through um, and to an extent the um, certain people were allowed through the force fields like the uncontacted um, tribe mm -hmm. in the Amazon and then there was talk about specifically brought up this idea of native land and I really really appreciated yeah. that um, yeah. and, and showing how that's just, you know, Native land, we, we need to discuss this and how things and bringing that point of connection back was really very well done. So I really appreciate it. It's, it's a pretty volatile issue, especially here in Canada in terms of sovereignty, um, sovereign claims and resources and how those two are clashing. Um, yeah. And that's an ongoing um, crisis, I think, uh, of our civilization. Um, but you know, in terms of migratory patterns, yeah, those, those are, um, those are self-regulating and they restore the landscape, they restore the environment. Um, there's plenty of evidence for that now that, you know, um, large herds traveling through an area will actually, uh, reinvigorate, um, dying soil and, um, scrub land and turn it into green pasture. So why wouldn't you? 
right? And they also did that fantastic experiment where they brought wolves back to Yellowstone Park and over a relatively short space of time, the wolves ate some of the deer, which meant that the deer kept moving. The deer then didn't eat the saplings, which meant the saplings had time to grow uh, stronger roots, which consolidated the riverbanks, which meant that the river no longer meandered quite so much and overflowed and caused issues, which stabilized the valley, which then increased this, which then provided natural ponds and things for uh, wading birds. Uh, the, and it was just this huge knock on effect yeah. from essentially the reintroduction of a small number of a predator species into a park. And it doesn't have to be a predator. I mean, beaver, you know, yeah. the introduction, reintroduction of beaver will just stop the certification almost immediately. It's extraordinary how fast that works. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, you know, na nature is sort of builds its checks and balances and, and it creates a system in which it cycles its nutrients um, in the most efficient manner possible. And it's always, you know, kind of awe-inspiring just to see how, how well the machine works. But I, you know, and I hesitate to call it a machine because it, it's, it's an interconnection of, um, biological entities um, that are, you know, creating more like a symphony than, than, than anything like a machine. It's Rachel, Rachel Carson. Mm -hmm. that, and uh, the, like, that's what popped to my mind when I was reading that. And, and, you know, Pinky's point about Yellowstone and the wolves there. Um, I think it was five years. I think that the, the, they reversed all of that going on in. Yeah. Yeah, but Rachel Carson, you know, discussed this, and it's like you know, you kill one thing, you think you're getting, you think you're doing a good thing. For instance, mosquitoes, and then you're changing everything. Yeah, um, because the whole system relies on on the little things you think don't matter because mm -hmm. you can't, you can't mm -hmm. follow the chain. Yeah. So um, obviously, one of the the things that I think we uh, should discuss are the the scenes about the ramifications of the greys because we ne we never see the greys themselves no but there's a very powerful emotive scene of discovering the victims of the greys and then i think that is balanced actually really interestingly by a scene later on when the survivors have recovered and you challenge assumptions about the survivors of trauma and mm -hmm. I, I think both of those scenes need to be discussed because I think they uh, there's a balancing between them that again it ties into a lot of the stuff that is happening in the novel. So, sure. Um, yeah, part of it was the research I was doing seemed to be indicating uh, among. Um, self-confessed ab abductees um, that there was a kind of a continuity uh, in terms of the experiences. One of them allow one of them basically being the equivalent of um, uh, that particular state in, in um, sleep where somebody uh, is locked in and they cannot physically move. Uh, that seems to be part of the experience of um, of these uh, almost aggressive forms of contact. And so there seemed to be uh, a kind of a, a psychic uh, switch that was used, uh, flipped uh, on these people that made them helpless. And, um, and so I, I try to interpret it in terms of kind of psychic feeding off of um, the most the most powerful primal emotions uh, that any life form would experience, which of course would be uh, fear, terror, um, these kind of things. And if you have a species that is um, basically defining itself on the, uh, on the basis of predating on uh, a lesser species, not physically eating them or harvesting them in that sense, but feeding off of their um, psychic emanations, 
then that is the species you cannot negotiate with because everything about their existence is designed and built around this one particular act. And so um, I, I wanted a, a kind of the, the opposite of what um, Adam and the three civilizations uh, were presenting. So I needed, I needed to sort of indicate that um, it's not all, um, it's not all fun and games out in the galactic community that there are uh, predatory species. Um, and, and, and that's sort of, I, I really wanted, obviously I needed to set up that external threat to um, trigger uh, some notion of uh, unification among, uh, among humans, um, crossing cultures, crossing cultural boundaries. Um, and so that's kind of where it came in. But then later on in the scene, you're talking about the chess scene, chess playing scene and, and, you know, the last line that, you know, they're walking around like, like sort of angels. Um, yeah, I, I guess it would have been too easy in some ways to, um, keep them traumatized, um, to keep them in, in, in a state of helplessness, um, because helplessness was the very thing that 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 they were experiencing uh, when being when being fed upon, when being preyed upon, and so psych, you know psychologically, the, their answer, their only answer, once being freed, would be the rejection of helplessness, which then empowers and empowers these people. Um, and that's kind of where I was heading on that one. Because one of the the aspects that I liked is. You have this, because uh, obviously there is a, a modern narrative, the urban myth of, you know, these people claiming UFO abductions, and it's always some some person in the outback somewhere, and uh, with the, I suppose, a, a certain economic demographic, educational background, all of these assumptions are made, and it's uh, the common myth told about them. And initially, that's what we're presented with, that, yeah, his, his wife had reported him missing, but no one believed it. And we see this devastated human. And even with all of that, that information, that bias that we have in the back of our head about this, about our judgments that we make about someone because of their socioeconomic or um, educational backgrounds, that that bias is, is there. And then we see, no, they're still a human and they have been preyed upon. Yeah. And it is upsetting. It is visceral. And uh, I think it was one of the most powerful scenes to see that and go, so many of our prejudices, so many of our judgments about other people are absolutely irrelevant when we start seeing other people as people, when we see the commonalities of humanity. And you then took that and in that scene where they're playing chess and you casually reveal that this person that I as a reader have made all of these assumptions about is handily beating everyone at chess because yeah. he's not an idiot. He's not some drooling uh, imbecile. He's a really smart guy, but part and parcel of where he was born, how he grew up, all of these things have fed into his position in life. It's not about the good get rewarded. And therefore, if you're ultra rich, you're ultra successful, you know, there's a huge amount of that is built into the system. Mm -hmm. And you can have great people. You can have smart people. You can have talented people who never have the opportunity because how our systems of government, of economics, of uh, culture, of education, these systems that we have put in place are not about helping every individual achieve their best. No, that's not the the thing that we do. So I liked. That's what I wanted to talk about in terms of those two scenes. Number one, that forcing us to look at someone and dispense with the assumptions, the bias, the prejudice, and go, no, look, that is a human. Look past geographical boundaries, political affiliations, 
every look past all of it that is a person and you break the reader down in that respect and then with yeah. that scene very gently introduce yeah but this guy is is really good at chess he's smart he he has these abilities well think of the pattern of predation um in in the natural world as you you know we talked about the wolves in the yellowstone um they take the outliers of the of the herd they take um uh the ones that are weakening um and so i thought in terms of the grays yes of course they would take the misfits and the outliers and the people living in, in the back end of beyond um because those those are the the perfect prey uh, nobody's going to believe them anyways um and the extent to which they're traumatized well who cares you know it, it's you know a lot of that scenario is actually drawn from uh actual accounts uh up in alaska so i wasn't sort of venturing too far away from uh recorded accounts and reported accounts so those things were very powerful um in terms of the in terms of the compassion um and like i i had said earlier when we were talking about it who you know who was on the moon base and who was going up there and the first people and they were going to colonize and they had women and they had men and they were going to start their own little kind of colony on the moon and and have the first baby born in space mm -hmm. and on the moon and and then to see these very regimented, very, you know, obedient um, people um, go down the hall and be disturbed by the utter annihilation um, and torture of the people that were lying in the rooms and brutalized. Um, mm -hmm. And then the utter compassion, even before they knew that they were being that the whole thing was being broadcast to the entire world um yeah. the utter compassion that they were treating the people with was very poignant um and it it was moving and then as av pointed out that very last scene um after samantha august has is, or is in the middle of um, giving her speech, you do you do have the seven survivors and they all walk away after her speech. And then the mm -hmm. next scene we come to is yeah. is Tony Newton playing chess and handily beating everybody. And the very, very last thing um, that Shen says is they walked among his people like angels. Mm -hmm. um, and that I felt was really very poignant as well, because mm. it, it brings up this idea that they have changed somehow. These people have changed the hearts and minds of the rescuers as well oh, yeah. in, in being yeah. rescued. Yeah. So I, I really, those scenes, even though they were haunting and, and really not fun <laughs> to envision in your imagination, yeah. um, it really touches the emotions and, and the heart and the compassion that you have to feel for these people that have clearly suffered and still managed to survive, but only seven. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was that was something really nice in that scene. And of course, what happens there is the whole scene is um, uh, hijacked by Adam and so shown to everyone on the earth. And so the natural secrecy that exists in um, especially um, any kind of sort of space exploration, um, but also politically for China anyways, just gets thrown out the window. And um, at that point, yeah, the, the rules have changed. The rules have changed. Um, well, okay, in terms of, I wanted to talk about post-scarcity because to me, that is the, the linchpin. Uh, that is that is the thing that is the only thing I think that will um, cr trigger an existential crisis. Uh, and it will be the kind of crisis that we have never faced before. And so it will be the one that 
that really, really forces us to uh, readjust and to possibly uh, create a new paradigm. And that is a transition thing that I just didn't see in for first contact novels. Like AP says, you jump over it, you jump past it. It's just not there um, because it's messy, you know, uh, in Star Trek's Eugenic Wars, whatever, it's all messy. Um, and if you jump past it all, then, you know, you, you, the curtain draws back and, you know, everything's great now and it's the Federation and, and whatever. Um, so, and, and so in terms of thinking of, of the storyline, I thought, well, it could be really, really simple that I just lay out a, a few ground, ground rules for ET, pull them right off the stage uh, once those ground rules are in place. And, you know, think in terms of, of uh, post-scarcity. And once, you know, if I were to take, for example, it wouldn't even have to be ET. Let's take this as a, as a thought experiment right now. Imagine somebody creating a, um, an energy source, um, something that could produce energy in a non-polluting way and um, is the only cost involved is in manufacturing of that thing. So in other words, it's drawing energy from uh, either electromagnetic, which people are, are experimenting with right now, uh, the planetary electromagnetic field, or it's drawing it from some quantum realm uh, where it, energy is basically infinite uh, in that realm. Um, what would happen? What would happen if that landed um, in our modern civilization right now? And that was one of the th things I was thinking about because as far as I can tell, it could bring everything down, absolutely everything. And if that's the case, there are a lot of smart people out there who recognized that. And the last thing they would ever want to see happen was somebody to invent uh, a zero point energy source. Because, it, I mean, it is such an existential threat to, to our civilization um, that it would bring absolutely everything down. And you don't even need ET for this, right? You don't need any, any, anyone outside these things. And so if these social forces are at work, the only way you know, in, in terms of writing this would be to hand to the ones who deliver this technology um, such power that they are beyond the reach of any uh, institution or, or power, power block uh, within our civilization. And that's why I had to make it uh, an ET. Um, because if I'd written a novel about some inventor in, in a garage who then comes up with this zero point energy, then uh, realistically, you know, the patent disappears um, and the guy ends up, you know, lying in a ditch somewhere because, um, you know, we, we historically already have evidence that that kind of shutting down of um, potentially uh, revolutionary information is, is, has already occurred. You know, Tesla's papers were taken away uh, by the government fall, you know, after his death and have never been released. Imagine that, they've never been released. It's pretty extraordinary. Your so, turn, Val. I actually was gonna ask you, I wanna know what you were researching, actually. I wanna talk about your research. Oh, novel. wow, it, it covered the, the, the whole gamut. Um, I initially started reach, researching um, UFO sightings. Um, and then uh, it went into uh, UFO abductions. And then from there, it went to um, the whole community that is seeking some form of disclosure of everything that governments know uh, historically and have recorded uh, over time. Um, but then I, I ended up uh, various areas of philosophy, um, cosmology, and then cosmology. Uh, I, I wanted the science fiction that I was writing to have a spiritual component. Uh, I did not want to just sort of make the assumption that, you know, the future is atheist. Uh, I don't quite buy it. Um, and so 
then I got into cosmology and um, and then questions and notions of consciousness and, and origins, um, sources, if you will, uh, of consciousness, uh, whether it's it's within the brain uh, exclusively or um, something beyond that. And it just sort of cascaded from there. And uh, I was reading all kinds of stuff. Um, uh, and watching a lot of stuff as well. Um, There's people like Stephen Greer and that kind of stuff. And, and then um, I knew that the second book was going to involve a lot of Mars. So I started watching um, a lot of the, uh, the public releases of uh, photographs from the various rovers and for, from the uh, orbiter as well. And looking at uh, the landscapes of Mars, um, just thinking in terms of where I was gonna set things um, for the second book. Basically, the second book is going to partially involve uh, an archeological excavation on Mars. So, um, so that, that got me into a lot of stuff. And then uh, I, I had to do some research on, on the moon and the peculiarities of the moon, um, the evidence that it appears to be hollow, you know, which NASA discovered uh, early on with Apollo when they deliberately crashed one of the uh, modules into the into the moon, and it, it rang like a bell for three days on the seismic reader. So um, peculiar things about the moon, um, and yeah, I, I mean, sort of once you know, I've got this whole bookcase behind this this. Um, this uh, laptop is all kinds of stuff. I can just start pulling things out. Uh, uh, this one, for example, which is, is an absolutely hard? stunning book of photographs. I mean, you know, stunning work. No explanations, just, you know, uh, <laughs> but geomorphology um, discussed. Things and then you get poke. what? Things they didn't poke. Yeah, uh, beyond Earth, blah blah blah. Uh, uh, Dawson Church, even Mind to Matter. You name it. I'm all over the place with this stuff. So uh, I'd say at least 200 books uh, related to just the research side of things. AP. No, I'm 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 good. You're good. Are you sure? Well, <laughs> then I think this might be a good time to release poor Steve from my grasps and to turn your channel back over to you. Well, no, so, you you start you started it. You thank everyone for watching. I'm You're in control. getting ready to like, give me a chance there. So thank you very much, Steve, for well, entertaining me and letting me talk to you um, about Rejoice because I thoroughly enjoyed every second of the book every time I've read it. Um, and so thank you very much for talking to me about that. AP, thank you very much for letting me commandeer your channel <laughs> briefly to um, talk to Steve about Rejoice. I really appreciate it. And I am glad you are no longer a unicorn. <laughs> so Val, are you going to be doing a, a paper on Rejoice at ICFA? Should, should I sort of trap you here now? Um, I can, actually. I, I was actually, I've had, um, as I was finishing off reading it, I was thinking about really good points that I want to bring up about it in a paper. Yes. So I was already bringing up the idea of that and I was going through and making notes and connecting it to other pieces of literature. Yeah, I mean, the only reading I've ever done of, uh, from ICFA of excerpts was that, was that it was there at ICFA uh, of Rejoice. Um, in fact, I think that's where I kind of debuted it um, mm -hmm. even before the book was, was published. Uh, that, that was the, uh, guest of honor year. I can't remember what. Yeah, you were. I was going to say you were the guest of honor that year, and you read from Rejoice. Yeah, um, yeah. I remember the audience really did not know what to do with that. That was. I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed it um, quite thoroughly, and 
probably pestered you a bit too much about getting a copy of it so that I could read it after that. Um, and I'm glad. I think I own it in hardback, in Kindle, and in audio. I own all three. So multiple copies of the hardback I have um, and given away. Cool. You know, it was fun. It was fun to actually talk. Um, I mean, it's so different to be writing um, mimetic fiction, basically. I mean, it is science fiction, but at the same time, it's set, you know, in a, yeah. a quasi version of this world. And it was such a relief in some ways. Um, it was a joy to write, for sure. It, I'm glad that you wrote it. I really am. Thanks. You're going to go out on a book tour and make people buy it for you. <laughs> Already. Well, thank you, gentlemen, very much for entertaining me. And I will see you probably not next time, but I'll be watching your videos. <laughs>